I now want to say a couple of words about our main speaker today and uh, let you know how he impacts us all. I don't think for a moment, as I mentioned before, that we can really achieve the goal of public-private partnerships as a way of running cities or states by simply going after some agencies or institutions. So you might ask, why even talk about it? Because a mind once stretched never returns to its original position. Joe Kent, our head researcher at Grassroot Institute, did a remarkable thing on one of his trips to the mainland to see best practices. He went to Sandy Springs in Georgia and he saw for himself the story you're about to hear from Oliver Porter. And he sat down with Oliver Porter and he did an interview which you can see on the Grassroot Institute website. Joe did such a remarkable job that I've asked Joe to moderate during this time and sit, come to the front. If Joe will come to the front and if Oliver will come to the front, you're going to hear some fascinating things about a man who not only has pioneered this concept of public-private partnerships, but is one of the leading consultants across the world to promote this today. Please give a big hand to Oliver Porter. And to Joe Camp. Thanks, everyone. Um, welcome, Oliver. Uh, pleasure. I, I underdressed for the occasion, obviously, but <laughs> for this, my corporate life, this was my, this was my armor. You know, when you made a presentation, you wore your coat and tie, and also Joe said, just do it, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to um, ask some questions to Oliver, kind of interview him here, and then I'll open it up to questions from you. So uh, we're uh, we're very happy to have your questions after. Um, but in two thousand five. You, the, you started to make this to create this city of how many people are there? Over ninety thousand. It's over a hundred thousand now. Okay, and Maui has about one hundred forty thousand. Um, so, I mean, this, you can see the comparison there. Um, what was what was it like f first when you came up with the idea and started to tell people? What did, what was their reaction? Well, let's separate the creation of the city somewhat from the way we serve it, which is the public-private partnership. The creation of the city had taken about 30 years, and when I say creation, we were an existing community, an unincorporated part of Fulton County, which is the largest county in Georgia. It's over 900,000 people stretched over 60 miles, with Atlanta cutting it in two in the middle. And we had been fighting in the legislature to, to get a city for over 30 years. So, so. I was not there for that long. Um, and the party in power uh, had just basically said, well, the phrase the Speaker of the House used was, uh, when pigs fly. <laughs> and when we had the governor out to sign the bill to create the city, we had a bunch of mechanical pigs flying. <laughs> so we sort of threw it back in their face. But um, the, um, a lot of people worked hard for all that time to get the right to create a city. And, and all we were asking for was let the people vote. Let's have a referendum and see if they want it. And they did. They, they voted by 94 percent to have a city. And in, as you know, uh, in our country, you can't get 94 percent of people to agree on anything. <laughs> that even that the sun comes up in the east. Uh, uh, but but we did, and that was great. So we were empowered to have a city, but no one had really the fight for to get it through the legislature had been so intense for so long. No one had really thought about how are we going to do this thing. How are we going to start a city from scratch of over 90,000 people? Compounding the problem was that the legislature did not give anyone any authority. We couldn't hire anyone. We couldn't buy anything. We couldn't make a contract lease until the moment the city started. And at that point, we had to have a fully operational city. How do you get from here to there? That's where I came into the picture. Foolishly, I, I had created a plan a couple of years earlier for starting a city because no one had done it. And we had passed it a couple of years and throw it away because we didn't get the bill through. And then all of a sudden, we've got it. The dog has caught the train. What do we do with it? And they turned to me and said, Where, where's that plan? And I agreed um, to become responsible for starting the city, not having the slightest clue as to how it's going to be done. Um, this was in January of 2005, December 1st, we had to have the city operation. Now, you, you weren't an elected official. No. You, was, were, you didn't work for the government? I have never been in any government capacity. I was, I was a corporate creature you, uh, in retirement. And you had no power? 
no power whatsoever. They, they agreed to name me the interim city manager because I needed a title to be able to talk to other cities. And the second request I made up before I accepted the responsibility was you have to give me the authority within this group to act. It's too late. We cannot act by committee. You have to let me do it. At that point, I was already aware that it was impossible. <laughs> you, you couldn't create a city without someone doing something. And so I began to look for alternatives, Joe, at that point. And the alternative that appealed to me, having been in the corporate world and knowing the resources that a major company can bring to the table if it wants to, that possibly the solution was to talk companies into spending the millions of dollars to set up a city without a contract. Um, so I sat down and I wrote a simple letter to 24 companies that I'd identified and I asked them two questions. Here are the 12 services I've identified with that we need, services or functions. Where have you done something like that for a government? A city, but hopefully, but any kind of government. And two, would you be willing to do this, spend the millions of dollars of resources to do this without a contract? Because I can't give you one. Surprisingly, 12 companies actually answered. Well, more answered, but most of them were like, forget it. Um, but 12 companies answered positively that they had done some services. Most of them stressed the truth a bit. But they had done some services. And second, um, none of them said they would be willing to do it without a contract. But a couple of them put in language like, um, let's talk about it. Maybe we can negotiate something. I took that as a yes. I went to my basement, and I began to write RFPs to start a city. At this point, no one in the city knew what I was contemplating, oh. even the future mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, I presented those RFPs in June to the committee. They were astonished, but they said, okay, if that's what we have to do. Um, but our attorney said, you don't have the authority to issue these. And I still believe they're wrong because I wasn't <coughs> giving anyone a contract. I was simply asking them for what they could do if we did give them a contract. Uh, um, Oliver, yeah. um, the, the uh, contract included things like 911, administration, uh, water, the water department, the permitting department, is this right? Some of parks, that. Parks and recreation, what, what, were, what government serv services? Basically what we were carving out was everything except public safety. And we're saying to these companies, can you do these things? Administration, PR, HR, um, billing, purchasing, accounting, IT, obviously a huge one. Um, not public safety, but even with, with the courts, the police, and the fire, we said do the backroom operations, do the record keeping for them as, and provide them with their IT support. Parks and recreation, transportation, which included maintenance of the roads and sidewalks, traffic design, traffic control, uh, the big one was community development, which is your planning, your zoning, your permitting, your code enforcement. All of those things, functions of the cities, we put in a contract. Public safety we did not, and the utilities, power, I mean sewer, water, those things, we contracted with the existing providers, the city of Atlanta and the county. We did, uh, and we initially had to contract with them for <coughs> police and fire, but fundamentally, they were raping us on that cost. Um, the state law says they have to provide it at cost, mm -hmm. but a good cost accountant can make cost be anything they want to do, mm -hmm. and they were just ripping us off. So within six months, we took the savings that we were getting from the other operations and were able to start our own police force, moving from 12 people that the county was <coughs> supplying to 135-person police force in six months. In a year, we, we brought on our own fire department huge negotiations with the county over the fire buildings, stations. Um, they claimed that we owed them millions for those and we said we've already paid for them and the taxes we paid, we won, we got them for a dollar through the courts. Well, so those are the things that were included in it and which reminds me quickly to say uh, with regard to your hospital, it's very similar. The hospital is really like a mini city. You have administration, you have PR, you have you have HR, you have IT, all the things I named except maybe for some roads and you even have grounds and roads and building maintenance there. So if you're talking about contracting for services, it's no different from what we've done. It's just a slightly, slightly different basket, but it's so doable, <coughs> so very doable. And uh, So I wanna, I wanna um, talk about the creation of the city a little later, but first, 
this, the city is created and it's run by a company. And what does it look like on the ground when you're in Sandy Springs? Um, let's say I'm driving along and I hit a pothole. So, of course, in Hawaii, we just, I mean, Star Advertiser just said today we're ranked one of the last uh, in terms of our road maintenance. But uh, in Sandy Springs, if I hit a pothole, what can I do? Yeah. And by the way, I don't like the term it's run by a company. The company doesn't run it. The company serves it. The elected officials still set policy, set the budget. The city manager carries out those policies and that budget and supervises the contract. So the contract is the company is really your worker bees. They're doing the work. Now, what do you do with a pothole? In the good old days, when we were part of Fulton County, if you had a pothole, you called and maybe in eight months, some, a crew might show up and there'd be eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was working. The other seven were supervised. <laughs> and maybe they'd get the pothole done in a week or so, maybe not. But what did you see the day after Sandy Springs was created? First of all, they showed up. And I want to talk to you about the citizen response system we put in for that. And it would be a two-man crew. They would have a T-shirt that says Sandy Springs. They would have a truck that has a magnetic sign that says Sandy Springs. They fixed the pothole. And it was a response system back to the city, for what I want to tell you about. The, here's the beauty. Second day, that same crew may be in the neighboring city of Johns Creek with a Johns Creek t-shirt and a Johns Creek sign, and they fix the pothole. And here's the real beauty. The third day, that same crew may be in a private parking lot somewhere fixing potholes for a private company. Absolute maximum use of people absolute maximum use of equipment. We own, as a county, as a city, no equipment. We have no maintenance shed, we have no inventory, no stockpiling. It's all provided under the contract, the services contract, and it works beautifully. The system that you, we put in to, to, uh, to respond to people, you, you dial Sandy Springs 24-7, any day of the week, all time, you get a live voice. None of this menu, dial this, dial that, it'll live voice. That person is trained to handle your problem and if they cannot find, handle it, like they, don't know, they can't go out and fix the pothole, but they issue a service order while you're on the a work order, while you're on the line to the proper department to have that fixed. That work order goes not only to that department, it goes to the councilman responsible for that district, to the mayor and the city manager. And there's a, in the contract, it requires a 48-hour response to the individual. And if it's what we call an emergency, and I don't mean a 911 emergency, but it might be something like they're cutting down trees on the lot across from me. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. Do something <coughs> immediately. There's a two-hour response for that. Then when that work order is completed, that cycle kicks back in. There's a notification to the city manager, a notification to the mayor, a notification to the council person and to the citizen what has happened. So everybody is in the loop to be sure it's been completed okay, properly. Okay, so I call, I call, I hit the pothole, I call the number, what if it's, what if it's at midnight? Same thing. On Sunday. You get a live answer, the person says, okay. we're sorry you got a pothole, I'm issuing the work order right now. And, to, and you will hear back from us as to the, when that will be fixed. Not that it'll be fixed in 48 hours, but you will hear back a response from us in 48 hours <clears throat> telling you what is the resolution of your problem. What about, um, are, is the call center in Sandy Springs? Yep, we contracted for that. Originally we paid the full price uh, of it, but we are now uh, selling it to other cities. In the case of 911, where we put in our own system, we're now paying only a third of what we, of our costs, because the other cities bought into it and that's cost sharing, and that's a great thing to do also for a number of services. It's like you can share the cost of potholes, you can share the cost of 911, you can share the cost of many other things with other willing cities who contract. Is the, is the cost, the people who are actually on the phone though, are they, do they live in, in Sandy Springs? Oh, or? do they? Uh, sure, some of them. I don't, I've never asked the question. The people of the community simply view them as city employees. They don't distinguish that they work for a private company or anything. They, they, they're our employees because they treat the people that way. The morale <coughs> of the workforce 
is tremendous compared to your bureaucratic cities. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, because they're being asked for solutions. I have had so many of them say, I worked in government for 20 years and I suggested ways to do my job better and nobody cared. And I gave up. I just literally <coughs> gave up. I came here and the company's begging me for ways to do the job better. You know why? There's a thing called the profit motive. If they can do it better and more efficiently, they can make more money. It drives, it drives the whole system to be better. Oliver, you mentioned something before about 911. It kind of jolted me. So 911 is run by a private company yes. in Sandy, Sandy Springs. Right. How does that work? I mean, wouldn't you think that greed would take over and, and somehow mismanagement would, would happen? Or how does that work? Well, let me tell you what we were facing before we did it. The 911 system run by the county, a bureaucracy, they couldn't fire anyone, they couldn't promote anyone, they couldn't, and this goes to every aspect of it, just not one. We literally had a case where a 911 operator was responsible for a woman's death. She did not perform and the woman died. It's clearly documented. That operator, and this was three years ago, that operator had a 12 year history of going to sleep at the switch literally falling out of a chair, reporting you were drunk, and there was no doubt that someone was going to have a bad situation with her. That operator's still on the payroll today in Fulton County because they can't fire her. Wait a second, I thought you said that the 911 was run by a company. It is now. I said that was what was going on before. Oh, okay. Fulton County simply could not <coughs> control their operators just like they couldn't control any other work because there was too much, um, you know, too much civil service and unions and all those kind of things in the way that said you can't manage your people. The company can manage their people. And they, they can move them from job to job. They can actually provide them with incentives. Uh, they don't have to answer to anyone to do that. That's within their contract, their ability to do that. The city doesn't own these employees. But I will tell you this, if, if we don't like the way one of them's combing their hair and we go to the company and tell them that, they're going to be gone because they want to please. That's the way they're going to keep the contract. So Oliver, um, yeah. there's, so tell me if I have this right. There's the county yeah. and then there's the city. Now the county, the city took over management from the county of all these services, right. is that right? So That's how correct. many people were fired after the... The city's doing these, all these new jobs now, presumably, so then the county doesn't have to do the jobs. So how many people, or did anyone lose their job from the, the government county then? Well, in actuality, after a year, no one in the county had lost a job, even though 10% of their service was gone, we were no, no longer <laughs> responsible for it. They were still, had all those people still on the payroll. Now, we, on the other hand, as a new city, and this is different from a city, an existing city that might consider conversion to the model. But in our case, we didn't have to worry about displacing employees. It was a simply a matter of finding them. And we basically got the best employees from all the governments <coughs> around us because they wanted to come to work in a situation where they could make a contribution and where they had good pay and good benefits, all of that, of course. But more important, I think, to all of them was the fact they could come to someone that would listen to them and let them do their job right and would give them a chance to, to grow. Uh, if you're doing well in one job, you may end up in Timbuktu with an international company. The, the company that got our original contracts, next big contract was in Dubai. And Dubai was planning, this was when the oil was going great, planning a huge uh, city of the future. They were even not even gonna have cars, they were gonna have pods that took you from here to there. I mean, you talk about stretching. <laughs> they were stretching and they wanted to hire a company to manage this whole process. This company that got Sandy Springs used us as they were the only company in the world who could say we actually do uh, provide all the services for a city. And they got the contract in Dubai based on their work in Sandy Springs. So employees at Sandy Springs might end up in Dubai if they wanted to be there. <laughs> the next contract that, uh, that the guy who uh, was the key uh, manager from this company guy, he went to Dubai and his next one was managing the uh, security for the London Olympics. 
So that's the kind of, it, it opens up a world of opportunities for employees. So you can, you can hire, you can fire them. You can hire, you can fire, you can give them incentives, you can give them the whip. <laughs> uh, you can do what companies can do. But the county, the government workers on the county, they were all still on the payroll, and even though they had less work. After a year, they were still, they had not made a cut. You, you Say it. You talked about the 911. How did the 911 work after, after the uh, the company managed it? Well, it's, you know, all I can say is it's worked very well. Their their responses have been um, time has been excellent, and part of the contract you write has to do with you set the limit. You as a city set the limits. You say in your scope of service when you write your RFP your request for proposal to get bids, you say the level of service you want. Now, the company can come back and say, well, you know, if we provide that level of service, it's going to cost you more. Well, it, it isn't going to cost us more if I can get it less from somebody else. So get in line. So it's a negotiated process. It's competitive bidding. You know, that's the way the system works. But, but you set, you, they don't, the company doesn't tell you what service it wants to provide. You tell it what you want, and then they have to tell you what they can do that for and whether it's competitive with others. So with the call center, for example, you say how many rings? How many rings it's going to take and what the, you know, what the time of response, how many people you, you know, it depends on how fine you want to map, but you might specify how many people you want on duty at all times to achieve that, that sort of thing. Satisfaction? Like, can you talk Degree about Degree of that? satisfaction, yeah. yep. It, th there are two things in which I judge success, and I want to tell you about the success of Sandy Springs, if you Please, give me a yeah. second. There are two measures, two broad ones. One, efficiency. Are you doing it? You know, are you spending taxpayers' money efficiently? And two, I call responsiveness. Are you giving the citizens what they want? And it's important that you go out and find out what your citizens want and give them that. And the way to be most responsive is to bring government as close to the people as you can bring it. That means we had a county of over 900,000. We had one representative from our area. He represented 180,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now, as a city, we had one representative for every 15,000. And initially, and I think it's still true, no representative, no council person lived more than two miles from anyone in their area. And I used to say this, and I meant it, we can get our hands around their throats. <laughs> We're going to have representation that represents us because <clears throat> they're here, we can get hold of them. And I think that is critical to being responsive, is to be able to bring government close to the people. <clears throat> We've done that. All the other cities that have been formed have actually been smaller than, than us. And I think another indication of satisfaction, several indications, one, we do internal surveys, but there have also been national surveys that we participate in, and in all of them we've been in at least the top 25%, if not the top 10% of satis citizen satisfaction. Maybe the best indication of that was the first election after the original election, four years later, all of them were up. The least vote that a candidate standing for re-election got was 86%. That is phenomenal also. That says, the citizen, you know, people aren't going to continue electing people when they're really dissatisfied. And probably another very telling thing is that other cities immediately began to copy us. And I served as the principal advisor to most of them, so they adopted this model. And it has worked. And, and when I say success, let me tell you about the financial success of it. Sandy Springs was formed just over 10 years ago. <clears throat> In that time, it has not raised tax rates one mil, one mil. No increase in tax rates. Right through the recession that was killing companies and cities all over the country, no increase. At the same time, we built up a reserve of $45 million. At the same time, we've been able to carve out 20% of the operating income to dedicate to capital improvements. New roads, new sidewalks, new parks, all of those things being, without borrowing money, carving it out of the operating savings. And finally, we had zero, after 10 years, zero long-term debt and liabilities for pensions and other benefits, which again are killing the country. The last number I saw, the combined total of state and local government unpaid liabilities in the United States was $5.3 trillion. 
trillion. And that's, by the way, not part of our national debt. It isn't even reported on the books. It's, <clears throat> but it's just as much debt as if you've gone out and borrowed it. So by any financial measure, we and the other cities are a success. And then, as I said, by responsiveness measures, I think in every case there, we are a su success. Well, I want to open it up to questions here. But also, I want to say that Oliver brought some books um, that are available in the back. This is uh, Creating the New City of Sandy Springs. It shows you, if you want to create a city, this, I think, shows you the whole, this is an instruction manual for how to do it. And um, it has all the requests for proposals and all the different um, legal documents. Contracts. That, contracts um, and things. Charters. Uh, Legislation, all, all of that is in the appendix. I did, I'm an engineer by training. I didn't consider myself an author. Um, but I started writing down things to give to the other cities I was helping. And pretty soon it got so voluminous, I said, well, I'll, I'll just publish a book. Mm -hmm. So I've now done four books on various sub, uh, parts of this subject. One in Japan, which I can't read a word of. Uh, and uh, a second one having to do with conversion of existing cities to the model. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is an e-book put out by a university in Guatemala, short e-book. Great, so um, well, let's give all of our uh, applause first. And then we can ask questions, so yeah. Yeah, Oliver, you talked about right now about uh, how you create a new city and how you create success or any precedent of taking a city that had this infrastructure and somehow they were able to get out of it and do what you're doing? Well, start off with it's not tougher. Technically, it's a lot easier. I mean, the idea of creating a city from nothing is a lot harder than taking an existing system and converting it. <clears throat> but there is one problem, and it's the thing called politics. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. It's politics. You, finding existing, I won't use this phrase in quotes, leaders who are willing to stick their necks out and do something <clears throat> different is difficult. Um, that's the best I can say. Um, we have proposed to a number of existing cities. Uh, we've yet to have one that's, we've been able to get a majority. We've had cases where, you know, some enlightened individuals said, yeah, we need to do this. But they're placing their own future effect ahead of their citizens. I, I was just telling uh, Ken on the way over, I just last year finished work with a county, a very poor county in Georgia, um, very poor service, very, very little income, deep trouble, very deep trouble financially and otherwise. Um, I didn't think I could get a company to even bid on them because of the financial problems. Seven companies bid, legitimate bids, and we were able to get a very fine contract drawn up. They voted it down four to three. It saved them 25% on their operating budget, and they voted it down. And they voted down for such, and this is on the record, intelligence reasons as we've been doing it this way for 100 years. I don't see no reason to change now. <laughs> and um, well, I went down to the meet the county commissioners in Savannah. Nobody else is doing it. And I said, of course not, you idiot. You'd be the first. <laughs> but, uh, and, things, and one who was saying, you know, my real interest is the employees. And my answer to him is, your real interest should be the taxpayers, the citizens. Sure, the employees are important. And they're not, you know, when you cut through it, they're not going to be harmed. Basically, in almost any city or government you go into and you want to convert, they'll have a... a um, attrition rate of around 10% every year that they lose for one reason or another. In most cases, the company is going to hire 80 to 90% of them. If it hires 90% and the attrition rate is 10%, you really haven't lost any one net. You know, one person might be gone because that, but, but basically on net, you haven't mm -hmm. lost anything. They've got better benefits, better pay, better training, better morale because they now can contribute and um, it really isn't that harmful to employees. You can actually write into your RFP a requirement for what percentage of employees you want retained. We wrote into that county that they had to retain 90% of employees <coughs> for at least six months. 
that would have given the, the company the time to sort through and really see who were the better workers and who were the dead wood. And the dead wood should be gone. That's just the fact of life. It should be. We, should, we as taxpayers shouldn't be, have to pay for them if they're not performing. So it scares the politicians, obviously, and I can understand the concern of the employees. That's self-preservation. You can tell them all you want that you, you know, 90% of you are going to stay in there thinking, oh my God, what if I'm the 10? Uh, so I understand that. That's natural. But I have no sympathy for the politicians. They are simply trying to protect their own jobs and to hell with the citizens. Is there any other questions? Have? Sorry if I'm just too direct, but yes, uh, so let me just start front. And oh, uh, Sean. Yes, Sean. Um, how do you, during the initial bidding process or um, when you send out the RFPs, what, what kind of companies did you send it out to? Because this was yep. something that was never done before. Right. Um, in that case, I had researched through a, a, a big book called A List of Companies <laughs> and this, that I wrote the 24 original letters to, and obviously the 12 that responded. Um, I didn't tell you about the governor's commission that was appointed. It was part of the bill that the governor was to appoint a five-person commission to assist us. <clears throat> it had no authority. The government appointed, being a politician, four people who had had nothing to do with the creation of the city. Two of them didn't even live in the community, and he appointed me as the fifth. That was a big mistake. Uh, at the first meeting, they asked me to convene the meeting on June 23rd, or I have a city, December 1st. June 23rd, I convened the first meeting of that commission. They, they basically did two things. They elected me chairman, because I was the only one who had any idea what was happening, not because of merit, but uh, none of the rest of them wanted to get stuck with that. And two, I laid on their desk this stack of RFPs about this thick. I performed a Nancy Pelosi. I said, you have no time to read these. <laughs> you must pass them tonight. But unlike Nancy, anything you find later upon reading that you won't change, we can change. So that's June 23rd. They were a bright group of people. They passed them. The next day I issued them to the companies that I had been in touch with that had responded. And then we did the entire public posting process that you have to go through, posting this to all the proper state and the local level governments, newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. At the pre-bid conference, which is mandatory, I had 41 companies show up. Now, most of those were small niche companies looking for just, you know, a little bit of the business. And I, I performed a mating service of matching those with others when they wanted to be uh, to, to let them get together a total bid. But we ended up with four companies that bid on the total uh, total operation. So we were, and they were good companies and we were very satisfied with that response. So it's not a problem to go and find companies that can do this. They didn't know they could do it. That's the funny thing. I had to convince them that they could do it, and other companies subsequent to that. And what I say to them is this. Uh, they said, we don't do this. And they said, do you do administration? Well, sure. Uh, do you do accounting? Yeah. Uh, PR, HR, yeah, I do that. Yeah, we do that. You do all those things, and that's what we need. And then the last thing, you don't pave roads, but do you do project management? Well, yeah, we do a lot of project. Well, that's all this is. You become the project manager for subcontractors. The initial contractor had 12 subcontractors. We didn't deal with them, he, they dealt with them, which is much better. It turns out the companies are much better with dealing with subs than governments are. And uh, so they pulled together a combination of all these to provide the full rail services that we need. So almost any major company, an IBM could do it, an AT&T could do it. Uh, obviously uh, an Apple or a Google would have the resources to do it. Um, they just need to commit to it and understand that they can do it. And then, you, then you've, got a, you've got a good base to draw upon. But what kind of line of business was this company engaging? They were primarily an engineering type firm. Man, again, project management is critical, and that's what they did. But there were, there were others of slightly different types. But the technical aspect of it scares, scares companies that don't do, for instance, road work. They just have to come realize they can manage that. Any they don't questions? have to be the provider. Yes, sir. Um, what are your sources of revenue and how much control okay. do you have over it? Right. The, biggest, the biggest thing that I advise any city that wants to convert <coughs> or any county, first thing you need to know is what are your revenues going to be. Yep. Once we know your revenues, we can shape a contract that will meet your needs. But you got to know what your revenues are. In our case, Sandy Springs, 
there were basically three almost equal sources of revenue. One was property taxes for the people in, in the city. Two was a state sales tax, which 1% of that is shared between <coughs> cities and counties, and there's a <coughs> negotiation process for who gets how much of that. There were 11 other cities. We made the 12th. We had to divide it with the county. But that's, that created about a third of our revenue. And the third stream is made up of about, in our case, 21 line items of taxes, fines, franchise taxes, hotel, motel taxes, liquor taxes, the whole array of those are lumped into one group and that made up the, the, the last third of the revenue stream. Uh, that one was probably the most difficult to estimate uh, originally. Now, of course, there's no problem to it. With that, I was able to create a budget knowing roughly what I was going to get. And I had originally set up 12 task forces to work on the 12 areas of service. Their charge was four parts. Find out what the county is now doing in this area that you're responsible for. Find out what they're spending on that. Extremely difficult because they didn't want to cooperate. Third, maybe most important, find out what our citizens want in terms of that level of service. And four, find out what we think that will cost us by going to other traditional cities like us and seeing what they're spending. With that latter part, I built a budget. Our estimate, and it was a good one, these were very talented, dedicated people. I had about 120 of them working as volunteers at one time. Based on what they'd gotten and put together, we created a budget and we expected to spend $50 million to create a traditional city to serve it. The initial contract was $29.7 million. That included $5 million for startup costs by the company. Remember, they had to spend that before we could even give a contract. So in essence, on a going basis, it was about $25 million, which is about 50% of what it would have cost us to start a traditional city. And I'm very confident with those numbers. I'll tell you how good our budgeting was. I took it on a month-to-month -month basis. This is what we're going to be spending. This is what we're going to be spending. And I took our revenue stream, which, by the way, was back end loaded. Uh, three fourths of our revenue came in the last third of the year. So that meant along about August, we ran, we're going to run out of money. We borrowed $10 million day one, bid that out to the banks. We had six banks bid on our business. They're very happy to have it. Here, here's $10 million. Get started. Um, we drew down on that, drew down on that. <coughs> Hit it perfectly in August, kicked up, paid it off at the end of the year, and we never owed a dime since. Hmm. But we knew our budgeting was good enough that we knew, you know, that we were going to need to borrow that money, and and when we would run out, and when we could start paying it back. So I I, I think our budgeting was good. I think that fifty million dollar estimate based on other, the work they did with other communities was pretty darn good, because all the rest of their budgeting was that good. So. It, um, you know, you, you've got to, and by the way, that wouldn't happen with an existing city. You'd already have a revenue stream. You wouldn't be back in loaded in that same way. It wouldn't be the same problem as a startup was. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, yeah. question, sir. Yes. So I worked in the government for 20 years or so. I just offered these two perspectives. One is the big concern one the government would have is you get, if you become dependent on a private company and there isn't adequate competition or whatever, and then the price starts going up later on. But the other thing is our procurement code was changed back in the 90s, early 90s, based on the American Bar Association model act. Maybe not the best people to do that. But what you're talking about, the free market development stuff, we don't do that because we can't. And there's a lot of restrictions like that that make it very obvious. So what'll happen uh, sometimes is that it works fine if you have enough people that they're competitive market, but you might have a specialized contract that doesn't it, there are not many people bid on it, and then you get in a bad, right. kind of get a bad situation. So, you know, your ability to go out there and, and do things pre RFP is yeah. huge. Uh, I think you hit on a critical point. We don't do a lot of specialized contracting. The important thing here is to have a big enough basket of <coughs> services that a company, maybe they don't do it all, but they can subcontract them, that they can have flexibility to manage, to move people, to move expertise. Um, around you, you want to be, and not just a narrow little niche bid because you may indeed not get enough good bidders for that but we can get enough good bidders 
for this whole thing now that companies have come to understand. One is profitable. We want it to be profitable. I had an LA Times reporter just went insane on me because I couldn't tell her how much money the company was making on this contract and because I told her I don't care. Because it's so much, it's 50% less than we could get it otherwise. I am delighted for them to make a nice profit. And if they don't, they're not going to give us good service, by the way. Now, are you stuck with them? No. We wrote into the original contract that either side, them or us, could terminate the contract with six months' notice for no cause. If we decide they have someone who's not parting his hair right, we can terminate. We never <laughs> did. It went beautifully. But we could have. I got a lot of heartburn from a lot of things when I was doing this because I didn't know what I was doing. Never having been in government. But after I had issued the RFP for a six-year contract, I found out that was illegal in the state of Georgia. <laughs> You can only list, issue a service contract for one year. And so I'm like lying awake thinking, what have I done? Well, we worked it out. We issued a one-year contract renewable six times. Uh, and, you know, and there were other things we had to pull some hair out. But th there are ways to do this thing, um, working with each state's laws. And, and they're all different. And you have to be knowledgeable about them more so than I was originally. Uh, but um, you can work out those things, but you, you're not going to be stuck with a company if they're not performing. One of the beauties of having the one-year contract renewed is each year there has to be a formal review of the production. And if they don't meet it, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to cut them or you're going to renegotiate their payment because they didn't meet you. Since Sandy Springs was formed, that original, remember I told you the original contract was 29.7? It's come down now to 17.8. It's come down every year. Why is that? Was the company ripping us off? No. They were smart companies. This was something no one had ever done. They built a risk premium into their bids. It would have been stupid not to. Well, now they, they, they're not worried. They know this is an ongoing operation. They don't need a risk premium. They need to sort of just meet their normal rate of return <coughs> expectations. And they've gotten more efficient, and the thing has come down and down not gone up, which is what's happening everywhere else in the world. There's one final thing I want to talk about. I know I've gone yeah. over time probably, Joe, but that's that whole area of unpaid liabilities. This is an unknown cancer in our country. I literally talked to the finance director of an existing city I was working with and asked him to tell me what, were their, what was the total of their unpaid liabilities for pensions, benefits, and he not only didn't know how much it was, he didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Finance director, man, he was acting, he wasn't there that long. Went through the mayor and finally got the number, it was $56 million. That's as much debt as if they'd gone out and borrowed $56 million. And they and the public don't know or care. It's going to bite us. It's going to bite us hard if we keep going in that direction. When you go to the public-private partnership, you eliminate that. You basically eliminate those unpaid liabilities because those employees are no longer on your public payroll, they're on the company's payroll. And the company has included the pension in their bid. So it's gone. The only residual for that is vested employees. Most local governments vest at about five or 10 years, meaning if you're there that long, you're gonna get a retirement. But that too is capped. It's not gonna grow beyond the time they go off the payroll. And most of those, the high payouts come from people in the last five years of employment. You don't have them there for the last five years. It's capped. It probably, in most cities, would add up to about 10% of what it would have been otherwise. And that's huge, huge savings. So there, there are several problems that the public-private partnership solves. It will do the same for the hospital. If you go that direction there, um, but um, I think I've overextended my welcome. Well, I, 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 if you have I more have questions, why don't you continue? That he, he's going to be here for uh, a little bit longer, so Would let's give right, him a round of applause. <laughs> Wasn't that inspiring? No. Yes. I just ruined your. We may not be able to I'm go sorry. out and convert one of our counties to immediately, <laughs> but as you leave here, think about what life would have been like here in Hawaii had we applied just some of the principles that Oliver has talked about to a recent project, the rail. 
in Honolulu. <laughs> with, with that in mind, I hope you'll keep stretching your mind. <laughs>